Good morning. It is good to see all of you this morning, and I hope you all had a great week. And um, this morning, we're going to worship God, and I would like to invite you to stand as we're going to sing our first song, Blessed Be Your Name. <clears throat> Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the darkness closest in Lord still I will sing blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name Sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. What's pain in the offering? Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Oh, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. And this morning we're going to read a response call to worship. I'll be the one that's really the leader, and the congregation will read the one that says people, and the last one, we're all going to read it together. Our purpose is awesome. Let us worship God. God is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. We do not come before God like frightening supplicants, but are those who are confident that they are wonderfully loved. Our high priest is Jesus, tempted as we are in the depth of our sin, who is able to sympathize with our evil weaknesses. Let us then boldly draw near him to the throne of grace, that we may be welcomed 
with mercy, and have not to assist you in your every moment of our need. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us to your home this morning. Thank you for everything that you have done in our lives, and we cannot thank you enough. As we are worshiping you this morning, help us to open our hearts and mind to get to know more about you, Lord, and help us to get closer with you and be with us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, I come to know the 
Morning, church. We have uh, one announcement this morning, and that is uh, just a a repeat of what was uh, announced last week, and that was uh, to let you remember that uh, we have a council member election uh, coming up on January Sunday, the 31st, so the last Sunday of this month, and this meeting will be held right after the morning service. And it is to vote on the nomination of Hank L. to the position of council member. And so for those of you uh, who may be watching this online, uh, if you are not able to attend that day, or even those of you who are here, you're not able to attend because of COVID restrictions or concerns, uh, Gord Wilkinson has been making connections via email so that uh, you would be able to vote uh, in that case for that election of Hank. Prayer concerns and thoughts and praises this morning. Uh, Anything, first of all, that any of you have that uh, you want to give thanks to God for? Any praises, thanks this morning? We've been watching. Oh, yes, Gord. Okay. So Gord's wife is home safe from B.C., so praising the Lord for that. I noticed our numbers in Alberta for COVID have been going down this week. I think that's something to praise the Lord about and to keep interceding for. Not every province is like ours right now. And for the wonderful weather. Yes. (laughs) A mild winter so far. I think another thing to praise him for that I was thinking about was just the gift of Jesus' goodness or his righteousness. I mean, without it, We can't enter heaven. Without it, we can't be justified before God. And the righteousness that he did is so pure and so beautiful. That's something that I've learned a while ago. So praise him for his righteousness. Okay, things that, any things and concerns that you would have that you would uh, like the body of Christ to pray for or to intercede for? Um, Yes, Hank. I'd like to thank uh, God for uh, taking care of Jonah. Yes, so last week week we were praying for Joan, and uh, she's here today, which is great. She's feeling better, but of course she has a number of uh, follow-up things to do and testing, and so we'll keep praying that the doctors will diagnose this correctly and be able to assist you. And we rejoice that you're here. Anyone else? Okay, before uh, we join together in prayer, I want to uh, introduce... Not really introduce. I'm going to use a prayer uh, that I have in this book. I'm reading this book called Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, Seeking God in the Crucible of Ministry. And essentially what this book is about is for leaders uh, to grow themselves in their own personal relationship in ministry as uh, leaders in the church. And it's focusing on us being still and being quiet before the Lord and learning to hear his voice and taking time to be by ourselves with him and learning how to lead through some of the pressures. And at the end of every chapter, there's an exercise that we are to do. And at the end of the second chapter, there's a prayer. And as I read and worked through this exercise for myself, I also thought, wow, this prayer is good for us as a church where we're at right now. I'm really just finishing my second week as your pastor, so I'm very new. And we have a wonderful journey, I'm sure, that God is going to take us on together as, uh, as he has brought us together. And I think you have hopes, I have hopes, we, you have expectations, we have expectations. And I thought, you know, we're all probably hoping that and expecting that, you know, God's going to do a new thing and we want some things to change and develop but as this prayer it's very short is asking for more than just something on the surface more than just something interesting but something deep within 
So I'll begin our time of prayer with this, and then I'll give thanks and, and uh, pray for the other things. Let us pray together. O oh God, let something essential happen in us, Zion Baptist Church. Something more than interesting or entertaining or thoughtful. O oh God, let something essential happen to each one of us in Zion Baptist Church and in each of all of us together as your church. Let something awesome, something real occur. Speak to our condition as a church, as your family, your people at this time and place that you have brought us to. And change within us, somewhere inside where it matters, that which needs changing. Let something happen in us that is real and for your glory. Father, we praise you and we thank you that you have been gracious to our province and the COVID restrictions, or not restrict, well, some of the restrictions have been lifted. We praise you for that. And we also thank you for the numbers going down, but we know, as our health authority has said, this is not a time to relax or to, we're not out of it yet. But we do thank you for this progress and recognize it is you who is being gracious to us. We ask that you would continue to be gracious to our province and to our country and to the other countries. Let's face it, Lord, we recognize we all have COVID fatigue. We all want this to be done and over with. But you have great lessons for us to learn through this. Give us ears to hear your, what you're saying to us and eyes to see what you're doing so that this troublesome time is not wasted in our complaining or ch chafing. But instead we see what you're doing and we receive it in obedience and with thanksgiving. Help us to learn these lessons. You even use difficult times and painful times and trials to perfect our faith. So help us to do this. And we pray that you would open up our leaders, ears, and other people of our land to hear your voice in this time. It is so different from 9-11 when we heard our governments at least say, pray to your God or gods. But this time, our governments, our leaders are saying nothing about you. They have no hope in you, not directing or asking anyone to pray to anyone. They all have their hope in our own ability, which ultimately comes from you. Forgive us, Lord, for this unbelief but as your church, as your people, help us to hear your voice. And may you shake and bring those who are full of unbelief, shake them out of their apathy or their deafness so that they may hear your call of mercy to them through these troublesome times. We thank you that you have helped Joan and that she is here. She is feeling better. But Lord, she needs continued assistance and follow-up, and we pray that you will grant those looking after her the right understanding of her condition and that she will uh, be cared for and diagnosed correctly. We thank you and rejoice that you brought uh, Brenda back from BC. We rejoice in these things given the type of conditions and extra uh, concerns that we have as we travel in a COVID world. So thank you for bringing her back. We appreciate your care for us in the most practical and daily things that we do every day. We also want to thank you for your righteousness, Jesus. You obeyed the Father perfectly, completely, 
did everything the Father wanted and expected. And you brought such joy to the Father's heart in your obedience. And your heart was full of joy as you obeyed him. Lord, we lacked such a thing. Only of you could the Father say, This is my Son, whom I love, and am I well pleased. But we thank you, Jesus, that you have graciously first took our sin and guilt and punishment away on the cross, and secondly, transferred to us your own goodness, so that as the Father looks at us, he sees your goodness in our place, given to us, and we're accepted freely, graciously, eternally. What a gift. We love you and we thank you for our salvation and we rejoice that our name is written in heaven. This service as we gather, Lord, is for you, to honor you. And we like and are rejoicing to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading is from John 5, 16 to 23, and Luke 4, 14 to 21. So, because Jesus was doing all of these things on the Sabbath, the Jews began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said, My father is always at work, even to this very day. And I, too, am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his Father, making himself equal with God. Verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father do. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Yes, and he will show himself even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Luke 4, 14-21. Verse 14. Now, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the news about him spread all through the countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. This is the word of the Lord. Breath. 
Thank you, Michael. So for three weeks, we are looking at a concept and a word that is often used in the church very often and spoken about, but sometimes we don't always understand it or know what we're often saying other than in a very general way. And that word we're looking at is the word ministry. And we learned last week that if we don't really understand what ministry means and what it is about, then it could actually be very catastrophic and harmful to us. In summary, last week we learned that ministry is something that comes from God. It originates with him and his character. Because there is only one God, God has decided to do some actions. He chose to act in certain ways. He's revealing himself. He, is, he has planned and acted to bring about a plan of salvation or a way in which humans can be reconciled to God. And he completed that. And then those who are reconciled to God, who have learned about him and come to know him through that one mediator, the man Jesus Christ, they then are appointed, they are given by God work to do, to join in the work that God is doing to further assist God in revealing and letting other people know who God is and what this plan of reconciliation is and how they may be reconciled to God. And so we came to this definition of Christian ministry. Christian ministry is the work of Christians in the world and church as a result of God's appointment to partnership with him as his servants, children, and ambassadors to carry out God's work at and under his commands. So very simply, what and how do we find the word ministry? It's the work that God has granted it to us to do on his behalf and with him in the world and in the church. It's our serving. It's our working, doing what God is doing in the world as we join with him. That's what ministry is. And, it does, and therefore, the next question is this. Since according to that definition... We are actually partnering with God in his work. Well then, that means we need to be doing as our ministry, as our work, the work that God's doing. So the question is this, what is God doing in the world? What is God doing in the world? Because we in our church ministry want to be doing what he's appointed us to do in partnership with him. And if we don't know what that is, Again, we might find ourselves being very busy doing lots of so-called ministries, even in the name of God, but we're actually not doing God's work with him. Or we could, at worst, even be opposing him. And that we do not want. There's a different, or there are different ways to answer that question. What is God doing in the world? And I have different ways to answer that. But today, I'm going to answer it in this way. John chapter 5, verse 19. And it says this. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. What's the context of this statement? So, Jesus, what has occurred? What is the situation that has led Jesus to say these words at this point? So if you go back to the beginning of chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, you will see that Jesus met an invalid, a man who was very sick, very weak, uh, not able to move about very well. He was for over three decades uh, in this condition, and uh, Jesus healed him and told him to get up, Gave him full strength, full health, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And so he did. And as the man is walking away, uh, going wherever he's going, he is spotted or seen by the Jewish religious leaders, and they jump on this guy saying, Hey, 
What are you doing? You're breaking the Sabbath. You're, according to us, you are working. You're carrying your mat, and it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day that you do no work and you worship God. Well, eventually the religious leaders find out from the man that, well, Jesus healed him, and Jesus told him to pick up his mat and, and go and carry it. So they then confront Jesus in verses 9 to 16. And they uh, tell Jesus that, you know, you're breaking the Sabbath. You can't do this. You can't heal on the Sabbath. That's work. You can't tell a person to carry his mat on the Sabbath. And Jesus, in his defense, <clears throat> begins in verse 17 with a fact that everybody agrees on. The fact that even God the Father is working on the Sabbath. God works on the Sabbath. He doesn't take a break. Because if God took a break on the Sabbath and stopped sustaining the world and giving us life, we'd all disappear. So it is right and good for God to do his works all the time. God is not doing anything wrong. And even the Jewish religious leaders agree with that. Even the ones accusing Jesus, they agree that it is good and right for God to do what he does all the time. So Jesus, then, his logic of his defense is this. If God the Father works without doing wrong on the Sabbath, and if I, Jesus, am doing the same work, the work of God, I too can work on the Sabbath. I too can do the good work that God is doing, and I am not breaking the Sabbath. Now in response, in verse 18, the Jewish le religious leaders accuse Jesus of blasphemy, and they accuse him of claiming to be equal with God. And Jesus then in John chapter 5, verses 19 through 30, begins to clarify, okay, yes, I am equal with God. I do intend to say that. But the way they and the Jewish religious leaders are thinking and the way Jesus is thinking is different. So he's going to explain how am I equal to God the Father. And that's where you get this statement in verse 19. And the first thing that Jesus is clarifying in his equality with the Father in that verse is he's saying, the Father is my model for what I do on this earth. So whatever work God's doing, that's what I'm doing. I will not do anything different from God the Father. I will not on a, take an independent track and I'll do my own thing. I will only do what I see the Father doing. He tells me what I do and I will do it. And I do the same things that he is doing. So the nature and the scope of what the work that Jesus does is in p full harmony with what God the Father is doing. And that, then, Jesus says, justifies him to do on the Sabbath what he's doing. But the point from John chapter 5, from this little episode, is to help us answer the question, well, what is God doing in the world is this. You want to know what God's doing in the world? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Jesus does what the Father does in the world. So if we want to know what God is doing in the world, we look to Jesus. And we have four Gospels, plus the rest of the New Testament, that uh, God inspired through the apostles that tell us who Jesus was, what he did on the earth, and how we are to minister. A good summary of what Jesus did could be found in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 21, the second passage of scripture that Michael read for us. It's, I mean, there's a lot about what Jesus did and said in the New Testament. So I thought I'll just introduce the basics of what Jesus was about from Luke 4. Now, this passage in Luke chapter 4, again, what is the situation? Okay, he's in a synagogue and he's reading this passage and he chooses to read it and say, hey, it's fulfilled in your hearing. I'm fulfilling it. So the context is actually Jesus is just starting out on his ministry. Actually, that is said in Luke chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 23. It says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. <clears throat> and just prior to that statement, what occurred? the baptism of Jesus. 
So you'll find that in Luke chapter 4, verses starting at verse 21 down to 22. And it, what is important to grasp there is that the other members of the Trinity, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, are endorsing Jesus as God the Son. So the Father speaks, as you see in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, uh, that he says, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased and I love. So the Father gives his full endorsement to Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit, as you know, comes down in the form of a dove upon Jesus. And Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. And then full of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit leads Jesus, as you read into the chapter 4 of Luke, into the desert for the, for the 40 days of fasting and prayer. And at, the near, at, some, at some point in that time of 40 days, the devil, Satan, comes and personally tempts Jesus. But Jesus, with the strength of the Holy Spirit, rebukes the devil and does not give in to the temptation. So Jesus is now ready to begin his ministry. He's now ready to begin to do the works of God on the earth because he now he has the full endorsement of God the Father and the Holy Spirit and he has proved faithful through that temptation of Satan. So now he's ready to go out and do the ministry that God has given to him. This then is where uh, he comes into Nazareth, his hometown. He goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath. He's allowed to teach. He gets that scroll, opens it to Isaiah, reads it, and says, now it is fulfilled. This is the beginning of his ministry. And this passage that Jesus is quoting from Isaiah chapter uh, 61, we can call it the Messiah's job description. It's a condensed uh, description of what Jesus is going to be about and what he will do on this earth. Now, we cannot go into all the details of it, but let's examine just five basic elements from this job description, which then help us understand, okay, in our church ministry, as we work and serve Jesus and God, may, let's make sure we have these five things in our ministry. So, first, of, first one, the why of ministry. So why is Jesus at this point launching out into his ministry around the age of 30? Why didn't he start earlier? Why didn't he start later? Why is it now that he's going out? Well, it says there in Luke chapter uh, 4, verse uh, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. So Jesus is launching out into his ministry now at that point because the Spirit of God has come upon him. And the Spirit of God has initiated it and said, now is the time, Jesus. Go and do your ministry. Let us go. As Professor David Hendricks reminds us, ministry is not a good idea. It is God's idea. Ministry is not a good idea. It is God's idea. And that's essentially what we ex uh, learned last week, that ministry, our serving and working with God, comes from God appointing us and choosing us. It's not our idea. It's God's idea. And he takes the initiative. So I don't have to explain all that again. But here's the question of the why of Jesus' ministry. Since he is the Messiah, why is he going out? It's because the Spirit is upon him and leading him and directing him to do so. But that raises the question that is helpful for us. When we look at our individual ministries in the church, whatever adjective we put in front of it, fellowship ministry, worship ministry, children's ministry, evangelism ministry, whatever outreach ministry, whatever you want to put in front, has those ministries been initiated by the Holy Spirit. Did, were those ministries just our own ideas or something we just copied from another church 
Or are those ministries something that the Holy Spirit has initiated and has his presence? Because if not, then we're just running a bunch of programs or a bunch of things. That's a good question. Second thing, that's the why. Second element of what Jesus will do as the Messiah is the how of ministry. How is he going to do his ministry? By what power? By what uh, resource will Jesus execute his ministry? And the answer to that is in verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to, and then it goes on. Jesus is going to do and fulfill his mandate as the Messiah or the Christ through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how he will do his ministry. We also need to do our ministry in the power and the, and the anointing of the Spirit of God. Because God is doing his work, and it is a divine work. We are mere humans. We cannot do it with mere human strength. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need him to work in and through us and, and to enable us to do the work of God. We could never do it in our own strength, ever. So we need to think about the how are we going to do our ministry with only our own intellect, with only our own physical strength and emotional, mental strength that we have, it will not work. Well, we might be able to create a so-called and humanize a good organization and have lots of people attending and whatever, but we may not be doing ministry. I mean, humanly speaking, people build large organizations and whatnot on human strength, but we're not, not doing the work of God. So we definitely want to do this with the power and the presence and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. But that word anointed, it says, because he has anointed me. Today, in Christian circles or Christendom, the word anointed is often misunderstood or misapplied and misused. Just kind of like the word ministry. It's said a lot in some circles. Or even the word Christian. Said a lot by people and completely misunderstood. From the context of Jesus' uh, preaching and teaching here in this passage, there's two things we learn about the anointing that is actually quite helpful that gives us a better appreciation of this empowerment of the Spirit and helps us more correctly understand the anointing for ministry. And I want to share two things from that context. First of all, the context helps us appreciate what the anointing is and what it is in that it does not exclude difficult times of temptation or trials or suffering. What happened prior to this? Before Jesus came to Nazareth? Where was he? He was in the desert being tempted by the devil. He was anointed with the Spirit, was he not? Yes, he was. Because when you go back and look at chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So Jesus is the most anointed person that ever lived. And he had direct conflict and suffering with the devil. He had to engage in trials and difficult times. And then what happened after this sermon? So you, in the passage that was read, um, it said that, you know, every eyes of everybody was on him and fastened on him. And that was the beginning of his teaching. And then, yes, verse 22, it says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at what's coming out of his mouth. But what happened when he finished speaking? If you look at verse 28, when Jesus has done his teaching, this is what it says. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They, took, they got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Jesus just said, I am anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he gets opposition and persecution like this. So, 
The point is, is that an anointing for ministry has nothing to do with a ministry that is just mountaintop experience after mountaintop experience, success after success. Some people think that, oh, if you're in ministry and you have the anointing of God or the Spirit upon you, it's just going to be up, 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 up and away. And it's just going to be victory after victory and, and uh, positive thing after positive thing, emotional high after emotional high. That's not true. Look at the context of Jesus who was anointed. He received both temptation and persecution while being anointed. So shall we. Difficult times in ministry as you seek to serve your God and Lord. Just because it gets hard and gets rough doesn't mean you don't have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Spirit with you. You cannot just automatically think like that. And the second thing that enhances our appreciation of the anointing is that it is sufficient. The anointing is sufficient to overcome the evil one and his demons. So we've already mentioned and referred to Jesus' temptation and how he overcame the devil. And the devil had to leave him. He rebuked the devil. And so, yes, uh, later in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 31 to 36, Jesus goes on as he left Nazareth to Capernaum. He does miracles. He teaches with authority. And with that very same authority, he casts out demons. So while the Spirit's anointing for how we do our ministry, while the Spirit anoints us with his power and his wisdom to do the work of God with God, that means it does not mean, sorry, it does not mean we will escape difficult times and trials. They will be there. But the anointing does mean he will empower us to go through them and overcome those trials. And he will aid us to go through, aid us and help us go through them so that we will still be able to faithfully do the ministry that he has appointed us to. That's how we will do ministry. Why do we do it? Because the Holy Spirit has chosen us. God has chosen us and sent it out. But the Spirit does not send us out without his power, without his presence, by which we have. That's how we will do the ministry. Third thing, third element from this job description of the Messiah is the who. Who is Jesus ministering to? In verse 18, read that again and Look at the people, the, the nouns that are described, are used to describe the people or to identify the people he's ministering to. Does it strike you as strange? Think about today in North America or Canada, US, how we might choose a target audience to minister to if you're planting a new church. Or if you're thinking about uh, starting a new ministry in, in the church, we might think more of along the lines of people like us. Well, let's reach out to more suburbanites or, you know, there's the more middle class people or whatever. But look at these people that Jesus is ministering to. They don't fit the demographic often of the North American church. There is the poor, the prisoners, the blind, and the oppressed. This, these are the type of people that Jesus is seeking to do the work of God to or for. Huh. Again, Professor David Hendricks asks the question, is ministry valid if the least of these, referring to the hungry, naked, and the prisoner from Matthew 25, and the poor, oppressed, and imprisoned from Luke 4 are not included. So that's something for us to think about. As we do the, as God's ministry, as Zion Baptist Church, are we reaching these kinds of people? Are we reaching people who are different than us? Now, don't forget the word, say, that he says he's to proclaim good news to the poor. Poor means more than just financially uh, lacking or economic, without economic means, without people who don't have money. People can be poor in many other ways. People can be financially rich 
but spiritually poor. They can be financially rich, but relationally poor and have very poor and bad or non-existent relationships with others. It talks about the oppressed in the, in, as one group of people. We may not have slavery in Canada like the slavery we used to know and hear about, though it is reported and is accurate and is true. We do have sex slaves in Canada. There's a sex trade in Canada. But think about how we can be oppressed and enslave people that you know and we know can be oppressed and enslaved to other things. People can be oppressed and enslaved to their work, to alcohol, to pornography, and to many other things that are harming and destroying them. So we can be oppressed and blind to spiritual truth, not just physically blind, but blind to the things of God and other such things. My point is using the language of this text, of the Messiah's job description, we need to identify who are we ministering to. Are we ministering to the blind, both the physical and the spiritually blind? Are we ministering to the poor, both the physical or the materially poor as well as the spiritually poor? and the oppressed of all different types. Because sometimes, I, perhaps it's, it's just natural tendency, we'll just minister to people who are like us. And we need to go beyond that. Then we come to the what of ministry. So we have the why. Why do we, are we doing our ministry? Because the Spirit of God is upon us. How do we do it? By the anointing, the power, and the presence of the Spirit. Who are we doing it to? To those who are oppressed, to those who are poor, to those who are blind and imprisoned. But what are we doing to them? What is that ministry we're doing for them or to them? So let's ask, what is the heart of Jesus' ministry in this description? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the heart of Jesus' ministry, the center of it is this good news, this message he is to proclaim to all. And the good news, as you know, is the gospel. It is the message that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And that he is able to save us from our spiritual blindness, our spiritual poverty, our oppression of the devil that we experience and the captivity to sin and to Satan. That he died for us in our place to be able to be, able to be set free from the eternal penalty of our sin and the oppression of the devil and that we may then receive that goodness of Jesus, that righteousness of Christ, and be reconciled with God. That is the gospel. That is the heart of the work that God, or that Jesus is to do. Proclaim that. Look, the kingdom of God is here. The rule of God is here. Repent and believe and be saved. That's the heart of it. Yes, we may use physical resources like money and clothes and services given. We may use our emotional and mental resources like education and counseling and a shoulder to cry on to help and assist others. But ultimately, all those other things are useless if we have not given them the message and proclaimed to them the message of the good news. Repent, believe, and be saved. There was a founder of a mission agency, and this mission agency did things such as establishing schools for children who otherwise would not be able to go because they were in poverty. They established uh, sources of clean water for villages. They did job training for people so that they may have jobs. But in the end, that mission, what was their central focus? Church planting. Preaching the gospel so that God's people 
would be called to him, disciples made. And yes, they did the other things, but the other things were ways to open doors to proclaim that message. And so the founder of that mission said this, what good is it to socially improve a person so they gain the whole world but lose their soul? And that's the point we have to remember in ministry in terms of what we are doing. It is not wrong to feed the poor and clothe the poor. We should. It is not wrong to seek and advocate for those who are oppressed and seek to see them released from whatever is binding them. We should. But if that's all we do, then all we will have done in the end is produce good, fine, self-sufficient citizens of a country. But they're still lost, still in their sin, and still going to hell for eternity. What good have we done? You see, we have something that the United Nations does not have. We have something that all your philanthropists of the world who give millions and billions to worthy causes, that we have something they don't have. We have something that all your social agencies do not have. What is it? The good news of Jesus Christ, which alone is the power of God unto salvation, right? And so if we are not focusing our ministry, if that is not the center of our ministry, seeking always to proclaim the gospel, we can really question, as a church, are we really then doing ministry? We may be doing some good things, some very good social actions and things that we should do. But if that's all we do, then we have become just another social agency, another club, or with good intentions. But we have ceased to be the church and do what God wants in what he's doing in the world. We must always have the gospel at the center of our ministry. Using those other things as ways to open up the doorways and to show God's love. All right. Fifth thing, so... We've done the why and the how and the who and the what. Now, lastly, the when. When is ministry to be done? When should we be about doing ministry? Well, Jesus said in verse 19, he came, came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, the word year there is not referring to 365 days, a literal year. It's a longer time period. So he's come to proclaim this period of time where God is extending his favor and his grace and his mercy. Yet, it's very interesting that in Isaiah 61, if you want to turn or scroll on your phones or tablets to Isaiah 61, let's look at where Jesus actually stops his quotation. There's, it's very interesting where he stops. So in Isaiah 61, Jesus is reading. He picks up verse 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from, the pri from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Notice that he didn't, he stopped before he said, he is to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. While he was on the earth and fulfilling his job description, his focus was on this period of time, the year of the Lord's favor of grace. The thing is, we don't know when that year ends and the Messiah, Jesus, is going to proclaim and execute the day of of God's vengeance upon all evil and all evildoers who have refused to repent. And we don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know when the time of favor for us or any one of us is going to end or anyone through their death. Or God's going to just end the time, the year of the Lord's favor by returning again as he promised, as he would. So that means there is an urgency to our ministry. When are we to do it? Now, not tomorrow, now. There is an urgency for us to be about our ministry each and every day that God gives to us, each and every opportunity. We, 
<coughs> excuse me. We need to be listening and seeking God. Give me ears each day to hear whom you want me to minister to. So as you go out to your schools, as you go out to your workplaces, as you go out in your families, in your neighborhoods, keep in tune. God, who is it that you want me to minister to today? Who is the oppressed? Who do you want me to show your light to that is blind currently? Who is it that you want to help release from some prison? Which poor do you want me to help bring your riches? We need to keep that. It's today, it's today, not tomorrow. So in conclusion, we've asked this question, what is God doing in the world? And from Jesus' own mandate as the Messiah, we have these five following elements that we need to have in our ministry as a foundation to be able to properly partner with God and do, be found faithful doing what he, the service and the work he's called us to do. And so why do we minister Zion Baptist Church? Zion Baptist Church, we minister because the Spirit has come upon us and propelled us and given us ministry. How do we minister Zion Baptist Church? We minister by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And who are we ministering to? The blind, the poor, the oppressed, in all their various forms that that takes. In Zion Baptist Church, what are we ministering? What is at the heart of our ministry? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And when are we ministering? Today, not tomorrow. And so that is not an exhaustive answer, at all, by all means, of what God is doing in the world. There's much more to observe about Jesus and what else is explained through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he spoke to the apostles and other writers of the New Testament and told us how we should do our ministry. But this job description at least gives us these five basic elements by which we can evaluate and measure ourselves properly so that we are found to be doing the work of God with him and not against him. So next week we're going to conclude this three-week uh, look at uh, a development of a, a what biblical ministry is and we will continue next week by just looking at well how is Jesus our model for ministry how does that if Jesus is our model for ministry how does that shape our ministry and there are some uh, helpful things that we can learn for practical doing of our ministry that we need to keep in mind and so we'll conclude with that next week and then we'll move on to the letter of First Peter. Uh, we'll go through the letter of First Peter after uh, next week. So you can begin to read ahead and read that letter and soak yourself in it. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have cons uh, graciously called us, not just called, you have appointed us to ministry, to work with God, to work with you, in your good and righteous acts. We thank you for this privilege. And we thank you that not only do you call us, you empower us. You give us the means to do so. You have sent your Holy Spirit to live in us and be amongst us as your church. And so we rejoice in the provision and the person of the Holy Spirit. We have learned today, Father, that we have been remember, reminded that as you work in the world, there are five elements we need to have. Help us to have ears to hear the Holy Spirit's initiation of ministries, to join you where you're at work. Sometimes we, even I can do this, we just make our own plans and we go about what we think is best. But sometimes our ways are not your ways. I think you say in, in the Old Testament that, well, you say that our ways are not always your ways. Your ways are much higher than our ways. And so help us to have that initiation and understanding of the Spirit in our ministry. And forgive us when we have tried to do our ministry in our own strength. No wonder sometimes we get discouraged or frustrated because we're not trusting you. We're not looking to you to provide. We're not looking to you to break through 
and help us overcome our opposition or to for you to provide and do the impossible. So help us to do it by the power of your Spirit. And sometimes, Father, we, we get centered on ourselves. We just get ministering to ourselves and not even looking beyond our own group. There is a great vast number of people who do not yet know you, who are lost and dying and going to hell. And we forget about that to our shame. Revive us and make us recognize how people are oppressed and blind and poor and imprisoned. And give us a heart for them. Your love. Give us your love first so that it may overflow for them. Just as you had compassion upon the crowds, may we have that too. Help us to minister to those whom you want. We thank you and praise you that you've already been at work in our congregation. And yes, there is some di difference and there's some diversity. And we don't care about the diversity point for being politically correct. It's politically correct to be diverse today. We don't care about that. But we care about the fact that there are different levels of some social economic classes and ethnic groups in our congregation because it means you're at work and your ministry is expanding just beyond who we are. And we need that to continue. Because we want to be faithful to minister to whoever you are sending us to, no matter who they are, where they come from, and what their background is. And then help us to keep the gospel center. This is what you want us to do. What did you say to us, Jesus? Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything we have commanded or everything you have commanded. Lord, that's at the core of a mandate there. Help us to remember that that's the center of everything. And we must be about making disciples, not just making healthy, self-sufficient citizens. In fact, that's the wrong goal. It's disciples we must make. And that it involves at the core telling the gospel and teaching all that you have commanded. So help us to keep our focus in what we are to do. And lastly, help us to do it today. Help us to have the sense of proper urgency, uh, to not put things off. When you say go and do it now, we will do it. Help us not to make excuses. Thank you, Lord, that you can speak to us and you can guide us and that you can enable us, even in our weaknesses and our failings, and even through our sinfulness, you can forgive when we confess, and you can still use us to be your church and to do your ministry, to do your work in the world. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for encouraging us today from your word and from Jesus' example. We want to follow him. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey.
of the world gives to you his people many gifts and ministries for the advancement of his glory stir up in you his gifts of grace sustaining each one of you in your and our ministry may the blessings of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be upon you all amen <laughs>